afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me to this important event. 5G and wireless technologies have certainly been our a priority for us, certainly in the Biden-Harris administration and very much so on the National Security Council. So I'm happy to be here with you today to outline how we are approaching this issue. As I mentioned, the Biden-Harris administration really views wireless technologies as a key priority area. And we know that in this space, we work closely, there are many stakeholders, from operators to technologists, the Hill, local government, and many other arms of the executive branch. And we know we need to work together to ensure that the United States and our allies and partners around the world have a leading and world-leading next generation wireless system. Wireless tech combines some of the most innovative developments across sectors, including artificial intelligence and machine learning, advanced software, cloud computing and virtualization, towards the goal of faster wireless networks. And certainly 5G and eventually 6G networks are where all these technologies intersect and have the power to transform lives in the United States and around the world. Increasingly, we're seeing standards, services, and applications that integrate mobile networks with other networks, such as satellite and Wi-Fi, offering seamless connectivity across these different technologies. 5G and 6G, therefore, don't only represent the future of mobile networking, they represent the future of the internet more broadly. So those technologies coming together have the opportunity to improve numerous industries, I think about data across sectors like manufacturing, integrated with AI to make sense of that broad data. Robotics, so that more and more manufacturing becomes automated, allowing for fewer errors and speed to manufacturing. We think about certainly healthcare, agriculture, where data collected across large amounts of agricultural can allow us to find crop disease much more quickly. Integrated with satellite communications allows us to identify weather patterns to ensure that crops can be watered based on weather, maintained in that way. So there's such opportunity in so many of these sectors based on wireless tech and based on that coming together of the tech, the data, cloud, and software in a much more integrated way. All of those different interfaces, as I said, bring so much promise. And along with that promise, they also bring risks, notably the risks of cyber attacks, either from malicious actors who try to disrupt those systems or from espionage. Because the more data, the more interest in those models, the more those models are driving us leading in various sectors, the more interest there is from both nation state attackers to advantage their own systems, as well as from criminals. As many of you know, specifically the People's Republic of China is the only country we believe has both the intent to shape, reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military and technological power to do so. We certainly have seen China engaged in an effort to dominate 5G and eventually 6G because of its global import, because of its economic import and because of its national security import. And we believe China sought to do so in the 5G context by massively subsidizing its vendors and using international technical standards that favor its companies so that they can be the most cost-effective option for nations, communities, and consumers seeking this significant connectivity. So the challenge posed by China's activities in these areas is that one nation which its worldview and its geopolitical competitor to the United States could control the future of computing, the internet, in a way that exceeds beyond its borders. And as I mentioned, these technologies don't just have civilian applications, they have military applications as well. Wars will be won or deterred by countries that master the networked battlefield having capabilities that can integrate those massive amounts of data from the edge, from each platform, from ship to air to army unit, and bring that together via machine learning, robotics, and other next generation technologies. 
So we, along with our international, with our allies and partners, can't afford to get our wireless policy wrong. Or we will face threats to our national security and even to our global security, given the role we play on the world stage. So we need to, and we're committed to, addressing this challenge strategically, beginning with the principles that guide our efforts. I mentioned how past generations of mobile communications have brought such value to our societies, from rural telemedicine that we saw firsthand during COVID. COVID also highlighted to us the gaps in access across the country and how important it is that we ensure that every individual in the US has the same access to learning online, to working online, and to all of those opportunities. And indeed, as we've rolled out these technologies to the most, to, to the edges across this country, we've also frankly seen that in the steps towards building those international standards, in the steps towards building these technologies, we've sometimes left security to be an afterthought. And those kinds of principles of security by design, openness and interoperability to allow as many players as possible to build on that platform and offer those innovative services, in addition to offering and ensuring the resilience of those services as they become more and more critical to our economies, to manufacturing, to each of the sectors we talked about, ensuring that we give that upfront attention to security and resilience hasn't always been the case. And we know we certainly have to change that because when security and resilience are baked in from the outset, they're cheaper and they become a part of those service offerings. So there's critical roles in, in doing that for government, certainly for technologists, research and development and academia as well. So to kickstart that whole of society effort as we look towards 6G, and on the heels of a recent 6G convening at the White House and the National Security, um, the National Science Foundation did together for just that reason. The administration has released principles to guide the development of next generation wireless. And the key thing I want to highlight from that list of principles is openness and interoperability. We've seen throughout the history of comms technology that openness and interoperability drives, open and interoperable standards particularly, drive industry-wide innovation and competition, driving down prices and just creating ideas we haven't necessarily thought of. We need to just think about the smartphones in our hands, in our pocketbooks, to think about an open ecosystem that allows for innovation in ways that we couldn't have anticipated when that platform was first created. We have an approach to mobile wireless that incorporates those principles today. Open RAN leverages open interoperability and standards-based tech to integrate chips and software from different vendors in different parts of the 5G technology stack. As with other open and interoperable approaches in other sectors, Open RAN, we believe, will enable greater innovation and competition, helping drive down prices, increase performance, and increase application of these technologies across our economy. And we truly believe that Open RAN will drive greater supplier diversity and resilience, greater visibility and control by operators in their networks, including more visibility into network threats and how they're being addressed. As we look to make investments in those core technologies, we also need to invest in hardware. And that's why President Biden made historic investments in industries of the future through the Chips and Science Act, which includes research investment, semiconductor manufacturing grants, and investment tax credit for chip manufacturing. Under CHIPS, the US government is also making investments in wireless technologies. And I'm sure everyone in the room is tracking the one and a half billion Public Wireless Supply Chain Innovation Fund, which will support efforts to develop Open RAN, ensuring that this approach to wireless networking spurs the development of 5G and 6G. And to further advance such wireless development efforts, the Biden administration also has numerous R&D efforts through NTIA, NSF, DOE's National Labs, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense's efforts across multiple military bases, with a specific focus in those cases often on security and on integration into the broader environment as a priority. We also need to ensure that we use the scarce and valuable resource that makes all of this wireless communication possible. 
the radio spectrum. Developing an advanced wireless ecosystem begins with R&D, but it certainly doesn't end there. It requires connecting more devices, transmitting more data, and developing new services and applications. With all of these elements integrated together, driving tech advancement and better affordability. None of this can happen if we don't make new spectrum available for wireless communication. That's why the administration is in the process of developing a national spectrum strategy, including identifying airwaves for more intensive and innovative new uses by both the private sector and federal agencies. We also need to make sure that the agency that's responsible for assigning new spectrum for commercial use, the FCC, and I know you'll be hearing from the chairwoman a bit later, the FCC has the authority to auction spectrum for new uses. The FCC in its history has completed 100 auctions, resulting in the issuance of over 120,000 licenses and permits and over $233 billion for the US Treasury. But truly, those figures are dwarfed by the main benefit. The FCC has used auctions to make available more spectrum for commercial use than any other nation, which has driven the world's leading wireless ecosystems here in the United States. In order to ensure that we maintain that lead, it's truly critical for Congress to restore the FCC's auction authority. Now, of course, the US can't and shouldn't do this alone. Meeting the challenge of leadership in 5G and 6G and the challenges of China's approach requires us to work closely with our allies and partners. And that's why we've signed memorandums of understanding and cooperation on telecommunications with several allies, including Australia, Japan, and Saudi Arabia crossing the Indo-Pacific and the Middle East as key areas of technology cooperation. We need to expand on these partnerships through public and private sector partnerships to ensure that we're identifying areas in which collaboration is fruitful and we can avoid duplicative or wasteful efforts. Finally, we know we need to focus and have a frank conversation with you in the private sector on standards bodies and standards setting. Last week, the Biden-Harris administration released a standard strategy for critical and emerging technologies. And we know that our public and private sectors, both in the US and across our allies and partners, have to come together to determine how we effectively address the need for a level playing field in standards bodies, and the need for us to ensure that leading companies can engage in an effective way to continue to be a lead around the world. I look forward to hearing from the speakers here about the future of wireless communications and what the US government can do to ensure that our policies ensure that we maintain leadership in this absolutely critical sector. Thank you for the role you play in that. Be well and all the best.